You know, I was a um, very vocal uh, non-advocate in back in 2017 because I, I I'm forced to live in a world. I service uh, pension funds and institutions with indexing. We we are 100% compliant 100% of the time. And my first purchase was not an, in our operating company. I just bought some Ethereum and some Bitcoin in a wallet myself back in 2017. And one day just talked about it in the, in on you know on television on business press. And my compliance officer called me up while I was still in the green room saying, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? You know, we cannot have this dialogue and because we're going to get a call. And sure enough, we did. And what's changed is the regulatory environment because I don't have the option to be non-compliant. I don't even have that at all. But slowly and surely in other jurisdictions first, Switzerland, Germany, France, Australia, England, Canada, which has allowed uh, ETFs now with with uh, Ethereum and with Bitcoin. So I changed when the regulator changed. And I'm very interested in crypto now as an asset class. And in my world, let's say, um, let's say you're running a, a, a billion dollar mandate, which is a typical mutual fund or ETF or whatever. And generally, if you're compliant with your own compliant department, they'll, there's 11 sectors in the S&P, for example. Uh, you're allowed to go up to 20% in any one sector and up to 5% in any one name. That's generally how it works. I argue today that crypto is the 12th sector of the S&P. That's what it is. It doesn't mean I have to have everything in Bitcoin. And I don't want to have everything in Bitcoin. I want to have a portfolio of crypto coin, chain, you know, tokens, whatever is compliant. And what's going to happen here and, and what, what we need to do and why I'm so happy we have these dialogues and these conferences. Think about the typical institution. Every night at 401, they mark to market every position they have. The internal compliance department sees it. How much leverage is used, what the positions are, is it within mandate, not over 5%, whatever it is. Then their external auditors come in on a weekly or quarterly or annual basis and sign those audited statements. Then they issue that report to the regulator. We don't have that infrastructure in crypto right now. There's on this stage, there's two guys trying to do it, Sam at FTX and Jeremy here at uh, with Circle. And I'm definitely involved with both of them because I want to be getting that. But it took me months just to get my first purchase done with, on Circle with my own compliance department barking at me like a dog saying, no, 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 we can't do this. And I'm saying we got to do it. We got to get there. We have to figure it out. And my auditor and the regulator reports we have put out. And it's working. Same with Sam. I want to build a portfolio on FTX, you know, because it's big enough that I can be compliant. It's, I'm the, and I'm saying to everybody on this, if we solve this, there's trillions of dollars coming into this in the 12th sector of the S&P. That's what it's going to be. So that's our job. We've got to solve for compliance. It's boring, but it really matters. It's, it's, it's a, a use case. In, in, in our operating company, about 18 months ago, we reduced our exposure to commercial real estate and it generated a lot of cash. And we went to our cash desk and said, what can we do on short duration? And they said 20 basis points, 21 basis points. Inflation is 2%. So that was the first time I said, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. And we started to look at platforms like FTX and, and Circle to try and solve for that. That's what got me into stable coins because we started to explore that. But if you're a consumer and you're 18 years old and you're making zero in your bank of whatever account and you want to actually get some yield that keeps pace with inflation, you can't do, uh, it's not easy to set yourself up unless you're really out there in the crypto community. WonderFi is going to attempt, and I think it's going to do a great job, to really simplify this for anybody. An app-based product, you download it, you, you ACH X dollars into your account, it writes the contracts for you, it generates the 1099 for compliance, it does everything you have to do to stay compliant, even as a regular 
individual being taxed in whatever jurisdiction you're using it in. And that's the beginning of it. I'm very fortunate I took it public a couple of weeks ago, and now it's, and it's, it was well received. It's one of the very first public DeFi consumer platforms in the world. It's in Canada, where the regulator is very accommodative. It will soon be in Germany, and we will continue to do it around the world. And then, you know, have the different case, the different use cases for it. I'm very interested in NFTs, for example, but not every NFT. I'm investing in NFTs for high-end watches. There's a community of people out there that have billions of dollars tied up in watches. They're all insane. I'm one of them. And we want to be able to have a, a way to authenticate our inventory of, of ones we own with the maker approving it. I want the D WonderFi app to also be able to allow people to easily own those NFTs without knowing anything about, you know, how to set up a wallet or anything else. It's attempting to simplify it. Now, I'm very fortunate. I have a very large social media following. I'm getting a lot of, uh, you know, feedback from our, our base. Uh, Josh Richards, who's a phenom on TikTok, is an investor, as well as Sam. I think he supports the democratization of this. And we, uh, we're very excited about where this is going. But it's really about simplifying it and making it really easy. I mean, we're all in tuned and excited about crypto, but it's not easy to use and it's nearly impossible to be compliant. You cannot afford not to disclose your capital gains and your income, if any, to the tax man. I don't care if you're 18 or 84. I'm the compliant guy. That's, I live in that world saying, okay, how do we get the forms out? How do we get the 1099s? How do we make sure these people never get in trouble? I, I would make this comment somehow over the last, I don't know, two years, um, the popular press positioned the crypto community as an adversary to regulators globally. And that's simply not true. And it's very stupid because probably some large percentage of the constituents in this room is somehow tied to financial institutions one way or another. And we have not even tapped, uh, it's so nascent, there's so many institutions that don't even play in this space, although they, although they want to. And the primary reason is their compliance departments and the tone of that relationship between the crypto community and the regulator. And every week we hear another case of somebody in, you know, in, in a position of, of, of uh, power, let's call it that, that's running a large uh, crypto uh, company, striking out at the regulator. Really bad idea. Like there is zero upside in that because the, the regulator wants to solve for this because this, and I'll say it again, it's going to be the 12th sector, the S&P. There's no question about it. It's not going away and the demand is huge. The tone should be that of accommodating their concerns. I'll give you a case study. This NFT investment I'm making in watches, is it a security or is it a piece of art? I can't go forward till it's resolved. I can't just throw it out there and start trading it all over the place, not knowing that outcome. And so I, I, I'm willing to reach out uh, as an advocate to that one little sliver of NFTs and say to the regulator, give me guidance, let's work together. And if it is security, tell me, I'm good. I'm good with it. I will treat it that way. I'm not fighting you on it. Just give me the rules so I can play football. You can't play football without the rules. And that's where we're at here. And the upside to solving this problem is trillions of dollars of assets that will pour into this. You want to see Bitcoin at $100,000? You got to let the regulator determine what terms they'll allow it to go into an, uh, an ETF. It's that simple. Look what happened in Canada. They got a billion dollars demand in a matter of hours in just the first Bitcoin product. And it wasn't even institutional. It was just simply retail saying, oh, it must be safe. I can buy it and put it in my my account online and the regulator said it's okay. So my thing is, as a, as a community, we have to for, form a lobby voice and say, we are here to serve and protect just like you are. Give us the rules so we can go back and play football. That's simple. So what is your prediction for where we will be 10 years from now in the crypto space since it's going to change everything? 
let me tell you the, one of the reasons that I'll make it short and sweet. Um, let's say a traditional mandate such as um, I want to go long Europe. I'm going to buy 50 stocks. I have to buy Swiss francs, euro based stocks and British pounds because I want to trade them on their domestic exchanges. In between me and that transaction is what's called the bane of the earth, the FX trader, the currency trader who clips me every time I buy and sell, adds zero value, zero value, and sucks friction out of the system and has my entire adult life as I've traded in Europe. I can't wait until we solve this problem and give them a new career, shining shoes, because they add no value whatsoever. This is where DeFi can take us on just one use case but it's a multi-billion dollar one. And I want to be alive to have a regulator domestically allow me a payment system to a Swiss franc back and forth if I want to trade it 50 times a day with zero FX traders. That's my mission in life, to help them find a real job. <laughs>